of Kings chapter 18. been reading this story in my devotions from the book of Isaiah. It's also found in Isaiah. It's also found in 2 Chronicles, but we'll read the version of it tonight from 2 Kings. But basically what's happened is Assyria is a very powerful nation, very wicked nation. And when I say wicked, I mean wicked. They were known, they had perfected the art of flaying a man, cut off all your skin and you still lived. They had perfected that, and they were, and then they'd just leave you out to die, and they would take your skin and nail it up on the wall and stuff as a, like, don't mess with me. <laughs> they, were, they were very wicked people, and the rough, I mean, they were tough. And so they came, and they beat up uh, Judah. No, I'm sorry, not Judah, Israel. At this point, the kingdom has split. It used to be David. This is a good history lesson. There was a King Saul, and then there was King David, and there was powerful Israel as one nation, 12 tribes, one nation under God, amen. And then Solomon did it. I mean, he took it to its zenith, but after Solomon, his sons split the kingdom. And then there was two southern tribes, and there was 10 northern tribes. The 10 northern were affectionately known as Israel. The two southern are known as Judah. And so just keep that in mind. The Israel, the northern tribes, the ten northern tribes were wicked as the devil. They had no good kings and they continually just rebelled against God. And so God brought in the nation of Assyria and wiped them out. And now that nation is coming against Judah. But Judah, though it's wicked and though it eventually is carried into captivity by the Babylonians, through its history and those two southern uh, tribes, there are some good kings. And one of those kings is Hezekiah. And he's the man we're going to read about tonight. He's the one that's um, the king of Israel at this particular time. When Assyria, these rough guys, they come to him and they say, uh, you need to pay us some tribute money. And Hezekiah says, okay, no problem. You've got to pay your dues. <laughs> and Hezekiah, uh, with very little courage, though he's a man of God at this particular point. He says, no problem, and he pays them, I think it was 11 tons of silver and one ton of gold. He even took gold off of the temple, the doors of the temple, to give to these guys to, you know, pay his dues. Well, it ain't too long. They, they come, those guys come back, and they say, we're going to destroy you guys. And he sends three... The king of Assyria sends three of his generals, and they meet three of Hezekiah's the nation of you know the Jews. They come out, and these three they're talking, and uh, the the Jewish guys are like, "Hey, stop talking in the Hebrew tongue. Let's talk in Assyrian language because we understand, and we don't want you know everybody on the wall, all the Jewish people. We don't want to hear what they. We don't want them to hear what you're saying." Well, these guys, are, they say it even louder in the Jew, in the Hebrew. I mean, they, they speak Hebrew, and they're, they're saying things like, why are you trusting in God? Don't you let Hezekiah deceive you. I mean, they're screaming that to the, the people of the nation of Israel. And um, so that's, that's, where, that's where it comes. And so let's begin reading then in verse um, 17. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse number 17. And the king of Assyria sent Tartan and Rabsaris and Rabshakeh from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. And when they were come up, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is in the highway of the fuller's field. And when they had called to the king, there came out to them Elakim. Uh, Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, which was over the household, and Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. And Rabshakeh said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah. Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? Thou sayest, they are, but they are but vain words, I have counsel and strength for the war. 
Now on whom dost thou trust thou, that thou rebellest against me? Now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, unto all that trust on him. He's saying, you, you Jews are going to, what you're doing is you're trusting in, in, in Egypt, and they're a weak nation. They're nothing. But if you say unto me, verse 22, we trust in the Lord our God, is not that he whose high places and whose, high, whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and hath said to Judah and Jerusalem, ye shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Now therefore I pray thee, give pledges to my Lord, the king of Assyria, and I will deliver thee 2,000 horses, if thou be able to, on thy part to set riders upon them. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Am I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. So right there he says, you know what? Your God's the one who told me to come up and beat y'all up anyway. Then said Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna and Joah unto Rabshakeh, Speak, I pray thee, to thy servants in the Syrian language, for we understand it. And talk not with us in the Jews' language, in the ears of the people that are on the wall. And um, we'll skip verse 27. That's not a nice verse. <laughs> no, we can read it. God put it in his word. But Rabshakeh said unto me, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men which sit on the wall that they may eat their own dung and drink their own with you? Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and spake, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and then eat ye every man of his own vine, and every one of his, own, uh, of his fig tree, and drink ye every one the waters of his cistern until I come and take you away to a land like, un your, like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of oil, of olive, of oil, olive, and of honey, that ye may live and not die. And hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuadeth you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and of Arpad? Where are the gods of Serpharvaim and Hina and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of mine hand? Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of mine hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of mine hand? But the people held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was, saying, Answer him not. Then came Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, which was over the household, and Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asa, the recorder to Hezekiah, with their clothes rent, and told him the words of Rabshakeh. So they got upset. Uh, Rabshakeh came and said, don't you trust in Hezekiah? Don't, if you don't, don't trust in Egypt. They're not going to help you. Don't listen to your own king. He doesn't know. And as for you trusting in God... He says, look at all the other lands that we've conquered. You see any gods helping them? Why do you think your God's going to be any different? I mean, where are the gods of Hamath? Where are the gods of Iva? Don't, don't be deceived. Come with us. We'll be all right. We'll take you to a better land, something like the one you live in. And then the scribes went to Hezekiah, and they told Hezekiah. Chapter 19. And it came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it, that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. That's a good place to go when you're having problems, amen. And he sent Eliakim, which was over the household, and Shibna the scribe and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, uh, 
the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and of rebuke and blasphemy. For the children are come to the birth, and there is no, not strength to bring forth. That's just an analogy saying, like when a mother's getting ready to have a child and the mother has no strength to deliver the baby, it's like both of them are in danger of dying. The mother may die and the baby may die. And he's saying, we're in a rough time. Verse number four, it may be that the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, hath sent to reproach the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. So Isaiah, they went, to, they went to the house of God and Hezekiah sent them and said, you go find Isaiah and tell him we got problems. And Isaiah said unto them, thus shall you say to your master, thus saith the Lord, be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard. Amen. That's got to be comforting. Because <laughs> you don't want to mess with Jehovah. You don't want to mess with him. Be not afraid, God says, of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. And so, um, fast forward in the story, so they felt like, okay, God's going to take care of me. Praise the Lord. And God did. God said, uh, God caused some things to happen, and then uh, the king, or Rabshakeh and the guy said, oh, we got to go down here and fight for a little while. But he, he told him, he sent a letter to him this time that said the exact same thing. Don't you trust in God? You let us destroy you. Don't you trust in Hezekiah? And what are your gods? How are your gods any different than all the other gods? They're not going to be able to deliver you. But we're coming back. we got to go down here and fight a little bit, but I'm coming back, and we're going to take this land. And Hezekiah, this is what Hezekiah did, verse number 14. In chapter 19, verse 14, and Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Amen. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent him to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone, where, therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. And so he prayed and uh, Isaiah comes and gives him an answer. He says, don't, don't worry, God's going to take care of you. And uh, let's read the end of this matter here. So verse number 35. <laughs> verse number 35. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians an hundred fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So Shennacherib, king of Assyria, departed. That'd probably be a good idea and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. And it came to pass as he was worshiping in the house of Nishrach, his god, that Adramelech and Sherezer, his sons, smote him with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Armenia, and Esar Hadon, his son, reigned in his stead. And so uh, this story concludes with Hezekiah. He, he does what all of us are supposed to do when you have a problem. You take it to the Lord. That letter came to him the second time, and he took that letter to the Lord. He went into the house of the Lord and spread that letter before the Lord and said, Oh, God, they have destroyed other nations. And God, they're blaspheming you, and you're the God who made everything, and you're the God who can deliver, and you're the one who made heaven and earth, and look what they're saying. And God says, Don't worry about it. I'll, I'll handle it. 
<laughs> and then that same night, the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, whoever that is, I don't know. I was talking with a little bit with the boys about this. This may be the same death angel that went through the land of Egypt. Maybe he had been on a vacation for a while and God said, I need you to go handle some business again. And one angel goes through in one night and 185,000 dead. They wake up in the morning, they look around and nothing but dead corpses. And I can hear General so-and-so coming up, uh, sir, we've got 15,000 dead in our camp. And here comes another one saying, we've got 25,000 dead in our camp. And they begin to total this thing up, and there's 185,000 dead. You don't mess with Jehovah. <laughs> he sends out one of his angels. One angel. 185,000. Done. And so, what's the point of all this this evening? Well, I think it's this, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. And that's the message this night uh, that I titled the message, Prayer Invokes Power. <laughs> prayer Invokes Power. So when you have a situation, I love what uh, Hezekiah didn't do. He didn't say, what are those guys saying? That's, let's get us a posse, get all the guys, let's go out there and let's fight. He didn't do that. He said, let's go to the house of the Lord. <laughs> let's spread out this letter and let's call on God to do something uh, in our behalf. And that's, that's, uh, that's the message this evening. Prayer changes things. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man in 2018. Change. God's still God. It's still real. He's still alive and he still hears and answers prayer. And all through the New Testament, we are commanded to pray without ceasing. And James says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And when you read the accounts of the Gospels, you find the God-man himself, Jesus Christ, our example, was a man of prayer. He would rise up early and go into a mountain to pray. And the Bible says that he ever liveth to make intercession for us. That means he's praying for us right now. I'm just simply saying that we've got to be men and women of prayer. And I don't have any, um, I think too often we get caught up in, okay, give me a good book on prayer. And, and the thing is this, <laughs> the best way to pray is just to pray. There's no like magic secret other than you just get on your knees and start talking to God. It's that, it's that um, simple, but yet it's that, that's for some reason the hardest thing to do. Many people would say, yeah. I mean, if we could be honest this evening and raise our hand, don't raise your hand, but I mean, mine would be the first to go up. Uh, is prayer one of your, you know, is that, <laughs> do you think you could use some more help in, in your prayer life? My hand would go, absolutely, yes. I need, I need to be a better prayer boy. I need to spend more time in prayer. And I just, when I read this, I think, man, Hezekiah prayed. He went to God and said, I, I need you. This, this thing's out of my hands. These people are ruthless, and they're vile, and they want to kill us, and I'm kind of scared, and uh, you got to handle it. And God says, don't fear <laughs> the words of that guy. I'll send one of my angels if necessary and wipe out 185,000 in one night the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord. You don't mess with God, and you don't mess with God's people. And God takes care of his people. And um, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What does it avail? I'll give you three things in about three minutes. Number one, it reminds us of our inability. That's what prayer does. Prayer, when we pray, it reminds us of our utter inability. We recognize, I can't do that. Yeah, I, I can't solve this problem. And we live in a day and age where it's all about you. It's all about me. I have power. I have whatever. But when we pray, we, we fully acknowledge, I ain't got the answers. I can't. I don't have the power. I don't have the means. And part of praying puts us in that place. Um, 
Psalm 8, 4 says, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Psalm 39, 5 says, Verily every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Every man, that means you think of the most powerful person you know, at his best state, and you think of him on his best day, in the prime of his life, God says he's altogether vanity. That means preachers, that means generals, that means me and you. <laughs> At our best state, we are nothing. We are nothing. One old uh, guy, preacher said this, when we enter the throne room of grace to pray, we know at once our littleness. And he said this, anything that teaches us that is good. An old veteran in God's service told some young Christian workers who were gathered about him, you can easily become too big for God to use you, but you can never become too little. That's true. It's easy to, be, to get to the place where we think we are big enough to handle it, but one great thing about prayer is it reminds us of our littleness, and that's good. <laughs> that's a good thing. It reminds us of our inability. Prayer requires us to trust in God's ability. Uh, Philippians 3.21 says, Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able. We have that little, he's able, he's able. I know that he is able. I know my God is able to carry me through. And he's able, the Bible says, to subdue all things unto himself. 2 Timothy 1.12 says, He is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Uh, Hebrews 7.25 says he is able to save them to the uttermost. <laughs> Amen. I mean, it doesn't matter what the situation is or it doesn't matter what you've done in life. The Bible says God is able to save you. He's able to keep you saved. He's able to save you. And ultimately, God's able to subdue all things unto himself. And that's going to happen because God's able. And when we pray, we are reminded he is able. He absolutely can we understand we can't, that's why we're praying. But in prayer, we realize he is totally able. Uh, God is able. Whatever his will is, uh, whatever is his will for us must also be his best for us. Whatever is his will for us must also be the best for us. And when we pray and we bring things before God and, and the answers come, we know that it's according to his will and that's the best. If we have his, whatever his, is his will for us must also be his best for us. So it reminds us of our inability. It requires of us to trust in his ability. But then number three, it allows God to handle the situation. I like that. It just simply, and this is part of prayer where you pray and you ask God for something. You have a need in your life, whatever it is, and you pray and you tell him what your need is. And then that's it. That's praying. You bring the needs before God. Jeremiah 33, 3 says this, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Amen. My pastor, of, he pastored 43 years. He, that was his life's verse. And he said, it's impossible, young man, to pray and not get an answer from God. And he would quote this, Call unto me, and I will answer thee. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You let God handle the situation. Hezekiah didn't get a group of, of army soldiers together and try to go fight. He went to God and said, God, this is what they're doing. This is what they're saying, and these are the true things, and we've got to have you. And God says, I got it. I'll handle it. Psalm 62, 8 says, Trust in him at all times. Ye people, pour out your heart before him. He, God, is a refuge for us. Whatever you're going through, the word of God says, ye people, that's, that's to me and you. I read these and I, I mean, I see me, that's me, that's you. Ye people, pour out your heart before him. Whatever's on, I mean, whatever's on your heart, whether it's promotion, whether it's next assignment, whether it's sickness, whether it's whatever it is, whether it's relationships, uh, whether it's church business, the Bible says to you, pour out your heart before him. 
God's a refuge for us, Selah. When you rise from your knees, leave the burden at God's feet. Let him, let God see that having prayed, you really do trust him and can be quite at rest about it all. Such a resting faith is ever a God-honoring thing. See, if you get down and you pray about a matter and you just leave it with God and you get up and you go on your business, you know what you've done? You've honored God. You have said, I trust he's going to handle it. And that, that type of faith, you are quite at rest about it, that brings honor to him. That's saying like, yeah, he knows. <laughs> he can handle it. And therefore, that's honoring to the Lord, and he handles it. And he handled it for Hezekiah, amen. He sent out that angel. <laughs> you just don't know what God can do. He says, is there anything too hard for the Lord? And the answer is no. There's nothing too hard. Prayer invokes power. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Well, what should I do, preacher? Well, just start praying. Just pray. I don't know how to pray. Just talk to God. Just get down on your knees and say, God, I know you're there. You've said you're there. And here's the problem that I got. Or here's the need that I have. Or here's the question that I have. Or here's the situation that I'm facing. And I just want you to know that I, I'm asking you to handle it. And I'm trusting you to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. And then you let God do it. Because we just reminded ourselves of our inability. We, we require it. We know he can do it. And then ultimately, we're letting him handle the situation. And he'll do it. Amen. Because he's that kind of God. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Let's close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the privilege to pray. And Lord, we're reminded that we are, mm, we have nothing. But God, you are all-powerful, all-knowing, <laughs> all places present at the same time. You can totally do anything. So God, we're just thankful this evening to be your children and to have, when we have needs, Lord, we can bring them before you. And uh, Lord, even now, we just pray that you'll work in our hearts and help us to depend more on you and to trust more fully in you and to spend time, Lord, as individuals, as families, as moms and dads, as husbands and wives, Lord, help us to be men and women of prayer. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen.